It's nice to see everyone here and be here and, and worship together. We're going to continue our sermon series on light in darkness, what it means to be a light, which just complements our theme for the entire year, which was salt and light and what that means. And I really love the sermon series. I hope you've enjoyed it. I know I have. Now, I've been blessed this Sunday with and the scheduling way it went with the preaching schedule for my name to fall under the topic of God's judgment, <laughs> the light of God's judgment. I think Nate is torturing me sometimes, but that's okay. <laughs> I'm really grateful, actually, to get this topic because I hope it's encouraging you. It's a really uplifting message, and I hope it is for you as well, and it was for me in my study. And I know not too long ago we talked about the Minor Prophets, and we mentioned this several times. But now hopefully we can look at this in a new understanding and a, and a different perspective. And I realize you might be you know, looking at the title there and wondering, that's kind of confusing. How is judgment a, a light? And I know even hearing the word judgment can maybe make us wince a little bit. We can easily become uncomfortable with this idea. And that's what we're trying to explore this morning, is when it comes to God's light and us being a light, how does judgment fit in here? You know, what we're not talking about, we're not talking about judgment between other people, between you or me, which God says we're obviously very bad at. We're not talking about, you know, judicial systems. We're not talking about prejudice. We're not talking about any of those this morning. We're simply talking about God's judgment and what it means for us. And so if we just look at our scriptures and we just read a few passages, some passages that might even scare us a little bit, spook us a little bit, but passages that many of us may have heard. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 10 tells us, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Hebrews 9, 27 tells us, and just as it is appointed for a man to die once, and after that comes judgment. Matthew 7, 2, Jesus says, for with judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure that you use, it will be measured to you. Ecclesiastes 12, verse 4, 14 tells us, for God will bring every deed, every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or or evil. And then a big one is Romans 2, verse 6. He will render to each one according to his works. Those are some heavy passages. And it doesn't matter if you're a Christian or not a Christian. Those words, those verses can, can scare us. They can strike fear in us. Big words and phrases such as all and each of us and given account and secret deeds and judgment seat. It's easy to talk about God's judgment and only see that and only see a negative, a negative thing. Only talk about it and talk about it only in a negative way. And while God's judgment can be scary and uncomfortable, which it should be to some people, for others who are genuinely you know, practicing their faith, it should be encouraging and it should give us confidence. But one thing we have to recognize is that God's judgment is absolutely, absolutely necessary because there is good and there is evil in this world. And that is just evident. That's plain. You turn on the news and you see a mass shooting in Maine. You see a massacre in Israel. These are tragedies. We can easily see that there is injustice in the world. And imagine for a second that we as humans did nothing about those things. That would be horrible. That would be a shame. That would be wrong. And that's why in the grand scheme of things we need, we need God's judgment. Now, when you think of God's judgment, I want you to think of God's judgment as you would parenting. Well, what is parenting, right? When we think of parenting for a, for a second, it's, it's very complex in practice, but on paper it's, it's very simple. Simply, we, we break it down, Parenting is just a practice of justice and judgment. And so often when our child is, is crying and they're angry, they're frustrated because they feel some sort of injustice. And they rely on you. They rely on your judgment to bring them justice. 
And so when a sibling rips a toy out of their hand, they feel wronged. Or when they're strapped in their seatbelts and they can't move, but they want that toy immediately, right now, instantly, just to exist, they feel an injustice. Right? When they trip and they fall and they hurt themselves, they feel an injustice. Your job as the parent is in every one of those scenarios, whether they're wrong or they have wronged others, is to bring order to that situation. And your judgment can look different every time. It can come in different forms. Maybe it's just relaying information. Maybe it's giving wisdom. Maybe it's exposing a truth. Maybe it's something else. Maybe it's extreme. Maybe it's a punishment. Maybe it's time out. We sometimes like to think of God, but we don't want to think of judgment. Because how could a good God be judgy? How could we ever have a good parent, though, that doesn't practice justice? And when we see it like that, we realize very quickly, since we are children and we are God's children, we need someone to execute judgment for us. And that segues into our first point this morning, is that, look, God's judgment ultimately reveals. It reveals. It reveals the truth. It acts as a light in every situation and in every relationship that we have. If you'd like, turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. We're going to look at a lot of scripture this morning. And we're going to make sure that every scripture we look at, we're going to try to cover the context as well. Because the context is key this morning to understanding what God's judgment means for us. Context is very important. So 1 Corinthians 4, if you turn your Bibles there, look at verses 1 through 5. We're told this is how by Paul, this is how one should regard us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required of the stewards that they be found faithful but with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court. In fact, I do not even judge myself. For I am not aware of anything against myself, but I am not thereby acquitted. It is the Lord who judges me, Paul. Therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart, then each one will receive his condemnation from God. You know, God's judgment should reveal something about ourselves. Because if we boil it down, God's judgment is very simply about our relationship with God. Notice that's the beginning part of this text. It's a relationship with God before it starts talking about God's judgment and what that means for us. You look at verse 2. I want you to look at that word required. What is required of us? What's required of us is that we are found faithful. That is a relationship with God. That is my allegiance to God. That comes first. And the person who is found faithful in the context of this passage does two things, we're told by Paul in verse 1. One, they are servants of Christ. That means we serve the body of Christ and we follow his will. What's the second thing? The second thing is that we are stewards of God's mystery. We handle the gospel responsibly. And we make it a priority in our lives. And what all that tells us is that those are actions of a pure heart. And that's going to affect our relationships in everything between others, ourselves, and even God. And so think about that for a second. All right, who is our, in your life, who is our toughest critic? Who's your harshest judge? More often than not, it's ourselves. We are. And what's comforting to know is that God doesn't judge the way that we do. And Paul even says, he says this, and look at verse 3. He says, look, my relationship with Christ is so great. I don't have to worry about any of that. I don't have to worry about the judgments of other people or human courts, he says, or even myself. Those things are very small. Those are small things, he says. When you judge yourself in your own life, is that a small thing? 
when you're scrolling or you're thinking about your life or maybe what you've done in the past or where you're at now, is that a small thing? That judgment? If not, then how is your relationship with God? Are there things that are hidden that need to be revealed or need to be confessed? Because to inspire change within us, we shouldn't care about anyone else's opinions other than God's. Because what does Paul say? It is the Lord who judges us. God reveals the things that are hidden in the dark through the light that is his judgment. And so God wants to know. He wants to know what is the purpose of your heart? Because that's the key to being found faithful. Notice that, how verse 1 ties in with verse 5. Being found faithful tells me what is the purpose of your heart. I'm going to stand before God. And I'm not ashamed of, of the things that I've done in the past that God has forgiven me of. The question is, when all of us stand before God, are we going to be ashamed of the things that we are currently hiding because God's future judgment acts as a wake-up call for us today in the present and if that scares you then yes something needs to be fixed and you know what that is but here's the comforting thing if it doesn't if you have nothing to hide then here's the thing God's judgment shouldn't scare us it shouldn't scare us to give more context turn over to Matthew chapter 12 where Jesus elaborates more on this idea. Matthew chapter 12, we'll start with verses 22 to 28 because that sets the scene in the context. And then we'll see what does he say about judgment? This is really enlightening here in Matthew chapter 12, verses 22. We'll start in verse It says, then a demon-oppressed man who was blind and mute was brought to him, and he healed him. So that the man spoke and saw, and all the people were amazed and said, can this be the son of David? But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, it is only by Beelzebul, the prince of demons, that this man cast out demons. Knowing their thoughts, Jesus said to them, every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste. And no city or house divided against itself will stand. And if Satan casts out Satan, he is divided against himself. And how will his kingdom stand? And if I cast out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore, they will be your judges. But if it is by the Spirit of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Okay, so what's the context there? Right, Jesus is healing this, this demon-possessed man here. And the Pharisees, they, they rebuke him. They strongly rebuke him. I want you to pay attention not just to how the Pharisees act, but what they say and how they say it. They say, you cast out demons by, by the prince of demons. And now look at what Jesus says, talking about judgment and talking to the Pharisees in Matthew 33, verses 30, uh, 237. Matthew 12, 33. He says, either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad. For the tree is known by its fruit. You brood of vipers, he says to the Pharisees. How can you speak good when you are evil? For out of the abundance of your heart, the mouth speaks. The good person out of his good treasure brings forth good, and an evil person out of his evil treasure brings forth evil. I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give an account for every careless word they speak. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. We read this and we always take it to the extreme. Ah, oh, I slipped up on my words. I'm condemned. Oh, I'm ruined. That's not what it's talking about. Yes, we will slip up. And yes, that's not good. And we should ask for forgiveness on that. But the Pharisees, when they say, you're casting out demons by the power of Beelzebul, they're not slipping up on their words. 
They're intentional about that. They've thought that through. They want to harm Jesus. The Pharisees are speaking out of their evil treasure. They're a bad tree producing bad fruit in verse 33. And those, those are the people that should be scared of God's judgment. And Jesus is pointing this out. He's pointing out more importantly that our words, what we say or even what we don't say, those are the things that can condemn us. They prove who we are, our fruits. And so either, verse 37, we are justified or we condemn ourselves by what we say. Our words and our actions produce fruit that, in verse 35, are either going to come from the good treasure or the evil treasure. And God's judgment, like a light, should reveal the treasure that is in our heart. And if you have nothing to hide, then Christians should stand confidently before God. And even on Judgment Day, when all is completed, and, and be excited because that is the time when you are vindicated. When we know this is why you lived your life the way that you did. And so what do we do about this? That's what it all comes down to. What's the application? And so we move into the application of our study this morning, and there's two points of application. The first is simply just a question that we should ask ourselves, right? What do we pay attention to? What are we paying attention to? That's really important to ask when it comes to God's judgment and how it's a light for us. I, I love this quote here by a writer that says, at the end of your life, looking back, Whatever compelled your attention from moment to moment is simply what your life will have been. If we are storing up for ourselves good treasure and we're paying attention to the things that are going to help us produce good fruit, then God's judgment should be encouraging. In fact, we should be excited for God's judgment because again, like I said earlier, it's a moment where God says this, this is my faithful servant. None of us are guaranteed tomorrow. None of us are guaranteed wealth or health. But all of us, all of us are guaranteed justice and forgiveness and salvation and love and mercy when we have a relationship with Jesus. And so if you look back at your life and you look back where you're at now, ask yourself, what am I paying attention to? Because God says, don't pay attention to the things that are going to cause you to drift away. And he makes this clear in Hebrews 2, verses 1 through 3. He says, look, therefore, we must pay much, much closer attention to what we have heard, the, the gospel, lest we drift away from it. For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable, and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation. It was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard. Our salvation is great. It's wonderful. Why would we waste our time paying attention to anything that would drift us away from that? God's judgment should act as a light to help us understand what am I going to focus on? And so Romans 14 is a good example of that, if you want to turn over there. Romans 14, just to give the context and the backstory here, Paul is talking to Christians. And these are Christians that are distracted, not focusing on the right things. They're judging others, they're condemning their brothers and sisters in Christ because of the opinions that they have. And Paul says, no, that's not what you need to be doing. And then he starts in verse 10 talking about God's judgment. And he says this, why do you pass judgment on your brothers? Or why do you despise your brothers? For we will all, all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then each of us will give an account to himself, to God, of himself to God. And that leads to the second point of application. When you look in verse 10 there, and we are standing before the judgment seat of God, we have to determine, 
Who are we going to be? You know, the other day I was listening to, I wasn't listening, I was watching an interview of some of these guys, and they were full-time caretakers for their dads that were military vets. And it was so encouraging to see these people to just take care of their fathers who have maybe been injured in battle or just sick or elderly. And the person who's giving the interview asked the question to these caretakers, you know, why did you, why did you choose to do that? Why did you choose to stop your successful career and take care of your father full time? Why did you choose to stop chasing your dreams? And I love what one of the caretakers said. They said, look, we need to stop asking ourselves, what can I get out of life? And instead ask, who do I want to be? And that's absolutely right. We need to stop asking ourselves, how can life serve me? What can I gain from this situation? And start asking, who do I want to be? Who am I? That mindset changes our entire motivation and absolutely should apply to our faith. Since we all know we will stand before the judgment seat of Christ and have to give an account for ourselves, we need to ask, who do I want to be? Who do I want to be standing before God? And if you're looking at Romans 14 and verse 12 is just ringing in your head, therefore each of us will give an account to himself, to God. Again, we fear those because we ourselves are an unforgiving, harsh judge toward ourselves. But there should be nothing to fear in those words if we have been renewed in Christ and we are continuing to practice our faith. Should act as a comfort. As we begin to close, let's look at one final, well, one more passage, and then another one after that, that kind of sums up what we've been talking about. Turn over to 1 John 4. 1 John 4. We'll get 11 through 18. And this gives a nice, clear picture here. Really puts, or should it, it should help us have confidence. 1 John 4. Verses 11 through 12. Dear friends, if God so loved us, then we also ought to love one another. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God resides in us and his love is perfected in us. So let's stop right there and ask. That's a good time to ask, who are you? Are you a person that loves others? Because as we read in 1 Corinthians 4, it's just out of the abundance of your heart, it overflows and you want to love other people? Think about that as we continue reading. Look at verse 13. By this we know that we reside in God and He in us, and that He has given us of His Spirit, and we have seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. If anyone confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God resides in him, and he in God. And stop again. If God is in us and we are reflections of his light, how can God condemn us? And that sets us up for verse 16. It says, so we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. Because God is love. And whoever abides in love abides in God. And God abides in him. By this is love perfected with us. So that we may have, and this is the part you underline, you highlight, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment. Because he is also, because as he is also, so we are in the world. Again, we have to see God's judgment and our relationship with him as a father is to a child. Because God loves us. Do you love God just as much? And this is how we begin to have confidence. Not just in our salvation, but when we stand before God at judgment. And I hope that you are that person. That person who is found faithful. And they're found faithful because they love God and they love God with all their heart and all their mind and all their soul. 
but only you know that. Because in the end, we condemn ourselves. We choose to be with God or not to be with God. We choose to be a bad tree or a good tree. We choose to fill our lives and our hearts with good eternal treasure or evil treasure. It's up to you. What are you going to choose? Who are you going to be? If you want to choose love and you want to stand confidently before God, then Jesus' famous words in John 3.16 should ring true. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. I want to keep reading because verse 21 is really good. The whole passage is, For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not, is not condemned. But whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God, Jesus. And this is the judgment. This is a glimpse of what is to come. Jesus says, the light has come. Jesus has come into the world. And people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light lest lest his work should be exposed. And verse 21 is key. But whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. Why are the righteous judged? So that all can see that your works have been clearly, clearly carried out in God. The question for you is, are your works carried out in God? And if not, then it starts by relying on the works of Jesus to be saved. By confessing with your mouth out of the abundance of your heart that Jesus is Lord and being baptized in his name, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit for the forgiveness of your sins. Because forgiveness is real and it's total and it's something that we can also have confidence in as we approach his throne. Do you want that forgiveness to get rid of your past and to be baptized? Come to the front now while we stand and we sing.